Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to the channel. So in today's session, we're tackling a pretty critical and sometimes honestly kind of distressing topic in endodontics, sodium hypochlorite accidents. Now, while these like don't happen super often, they can lead to some serious complications if they're not handled properly. So um, our goal in this video is to walk through uh, how to recognize an extrusion, how to respond calmly and effectively, and how to like guide your patient back toward a safe and successful outcome. So yeah, let's just get right into it. All right, so when we talk about a hypochlorite accident, we're basically referring to a situation where sodium hypochlorite, you know, the main irrigant we use during root canals, somehow escapes through the apex or maybe through lateral canals or even a perforation, and it seeps into the surrounding soft tissues or uh, sometimes even into facial spaces. And because hypochlorite is super cytotoxic and has this really high pH, even a small amount getting out of the canal can lead to tissue necrosis, sharp pain, swelling, bruising, and like in really bad cases, even sensory nerve issues or airway problems. So um, why does this happen? Well, there are a bunch of contributing factors. One is using too much pressure when irrigating, especially if you've got the syringe wedged apically with a needle that's too deep, right? Then there's anatomy. Like if you've got open apices or, or large foramina or maybe thin cortical bone, which is especially common in maxillary molars. And of course, if there's already a perforation some, somewhere in the canal wall, then yeah, you're, you're way more likely to have leakage into surrounding tissue. A lot of studies actually show that when clinicians push past the recommended safety limits, that's when they end up causing damage to the periapical tissues. So um, how do you know it's happening? Well, the very first sign is usually this sudden intense burning or sharp pain, like way more than what you'd expect, even with anesthesia. And that pain is often followed pretty quickly by swelling, redness, and uh, sometimes bruising around the affected area. Now, if your patient suddenly tells you they're in intense pain during irrigation, you've got to stop immediately. Like, don't wait or assume it's just normal endo discomfort. First thing, remove the rubber dam and clamps so you can, like, fully inspect the area. A lot of times, swelling is, like, hidden under the dam or tissue tension, so you really want a clear view. Once you're pretty sure an extrusion has occurred, you want to go through a step-by-step -step response, but, like, calmly. So first, try to aspirate any visible irrigant using uh, like a fine needle or even a surgical suction tip. The goal is to reduce how much of the chemical is sitting in the tissue. Then you're going to need to give some more lo local anesthesia. Even though the canal might already be numb, the soft tissue pain can be really intense. After that, stop using sodium hypochlorite completely. Instead, switch over to normal saline and flush the canal with a lot of it just to like dilute and wash out any of the residual chemical. Once that's done, dry the canals thoroughly and place calcium hydroxide inside as an, intra, as an intracanal medicament. It helps like soothe the tissues and buffer the pH. Then go ahead and seal the access cavity with glass ionomer cement or a good temporary filling just to keep the area protected. Externally, for the first six hours, you'll wanna apply a cold compress like intermittently to help control inflammation and reduce bruising. And you'll wanna get NSAIDs on board right away since these patients often start to feel more pain as the hours go on. Now let's talk about the next steps, like what you need to do within the first 24 hours. Most of the time, your patient's gonna have more swelling and bruising by the next day. They might also report some numbness or tingling, usually in the lip or cheek, and that suggests there's some temporary involvement of sensory nerves you definitely wanna either bring them in or at the very least call them within 24 hours to check in. You're looking out for any signs of tissue necrosis, uh, expanding swelling, nerve involvement, or infection. If, if you see any necrotic tissue or signs of infection, then yeah, start them on antibiotics. Also encourage them to use chlorhexidine mouth rinses or like warm salt water rinses a few times a day to support healing and keep things clean. After about six hours of cold application, it's better to switch to warm compresses. That helps encourage circulation and healing, and it just feels more comfortable for the patient. Let them know they should do it a few times a day. Then around the seven day mark, you should have the patient come back for a follow-up. By this point, most of the swelling should be down. 
you might still see some bruising, but it should be healing. You'll also likely see some ulceration, which is actually just necrotic tissue sloughing off. It's important here to check their sensory and motor function. Is their lip sensation coming back? Can they move their cheek muscles normally again? Make sure you document everything carefully. Then at the three week mark, so like 21 days out, do a final check. Usually by this point, the worst of it is over. Most patients show pretty solid healing by then. If the area looks healthy and there's no infection or necrosis left, it's probably safe to go ahead and continue the root canal therapy. Uh, but that call should always be based on your clinical judgment and what you're seeing in the mouth. When you do go back in to treat the tooth, definitely avoid using sodium hypochlorite again, at least not in that session. You can switch to something like EDTA, chlorhexidine, or sterile saline, basically anything gentler that won't irritate the already compromised tissues. Just make sure everything's healed and asymptomatic before you begin anesthesia and reinstrumentation. Now, um, if symptoms get worse, like if they're spreading swelling, ongoing numbness, or signs of deep space infection, then you've got to refer them out. That's when you need an urgent evaluation by oral surgery or maxillofacial specialists and possibly imaging. Compartment syndrome and vascular issues are super rare, but yeah, they can happen. So all that said, prevention is way better than having to manage this. To avoid hypochlorite accidents, always use side vented needles or ones that don't wedge at the apex. Confirm your working length carefully, both radiographically and with an apex locator, and never push the needle all the way to the end. Irrigate gently, like never force the irrigant. And always be mindful of anatomical variations. Open apices, big canals, or any signs of perforation need special caution. These prevention strategies are all backed by endodontic clinical guidelines. All right, so just to wrap up, sodium hypochlorite extrusions are rare, but yeah, they're serious. Recognizing them early, staying calm, and following a structured response and follow-up plan are what make the difference. And as always, prevention is your best defense. If this helped clear things up for you, go ahead and like the video, hit subscribe, and um, if you've ever dealt with a tough case like this, let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear how you handled it. Thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.